Good afternoon, everyone. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we thank Thee for the many blessings You've bestowed upon us this week. We thank You for Your guidance, for Your love, for Your help in all that You have done. Thank You for listening to us. Though we don't get the prayers answered the way we want, we know that You'll do the things that's necessary for us to sustain ourselves here in this life. Thank You for guiding us and keeping us safe. In Your name we pray. Amen. The title of the sermon today is The Holy Spirit. It was a dark night in old Jerusalem when a small group of men met with their Lord in the upper room. He had fastened a towel around his waist and knelt down at each of them and washed their feet. They had partaken of the bread and poured out the wine, symbols of his approaching death. Judas, he had already left. <clears throat> The group now Satan, I mean now Christ was alone with the leaven. <clears throat> Their hearts were filled with sadness and foreboding. They knew that room or soon he would die. They had looked to him for help in all their difficulties, sorrows, and disappointments. Now the time had come for them to leave. They were pressing close to him, listening to every word that he spoke. And he gives them a word of hope. This is taken from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. One day, this gentleman, Alex Winton, organist of the church in uh, St. John of the Divine in New York City, was playing a dictatory program in West Majestic New Westminster Presbyterian Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Actually, it was Greenville, excuse me. The audience was waiting for the first note, but no sound came. Realizing what had happened, he turned toward the people and said, Folks, there's one thing we cannot do without, and that's power. I know the notes, and I know the music. But without the electrical power, I cannot play. Would somebody please turn on the power? Our lives may be too concerned with things, with the Ties with efforts, without power, the power of the Holy Spirit is of in life. There is no freedom or joy or victory. We will be playing empty notes so far as heaven is concerned. So divine music, no divine music. Are we willing to receive the indwelling in, in our lives of the Holy Spirit? Certainly, the greatest need of Christians today is spiritual power, a power which beneath is exercising a strange, bewitching influence on the world. A negative influence is everywhere in politics, economics, social life, ecclesiastical life, everywhere. The icy chill of skepticism and outright Infidelity is covering the earth like a rising tide. The presence of the Holy Spirit is virtually important today in this world where we live. His presence and power must awaken the church and the Christians. There are some points regarding this that we must consider. Certainly an important one is how can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? How can we be used by the Holy Spirit? Empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Bible gives us conditions. First, we, what, we must ask him. We must realize out our need and respond by earnest prayer. You take Jesus, for example, when uh, 
in the third chapter of Luke and 21 and 22, Jesus said, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heavens basically opened and the Holy Ghost descended in the bodily shape of an, uh, a dove upon him. And a voice from heaven came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Notice, there was prayer first. Jesus prayed, then the heavens was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended. And then came the voice of approval from his Father. Certainly a prayerless life is a spiritual life, sp spiritless life, excuse me. Earnest prayer practices or proceeds spiritual victory and opens a way for the Holy Spirit to enter our lives. Another condition for the infilling of the Holy Spirit is unity among Christians. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit is the bond of Jesus in Ephesians 4, 3. The Lord will not baptize us with the Holy Spirit if there is discord, dissension, or whatever is going on in the church. There is another condition. We must have right motives. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Sometimes we do not receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit because our motives are wrong. The Holy Spirit is so exalt, excuse me, the Holy Spirit is to exalt not us, but Christ. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, he shall testify of me. We repeat this text because it is important. The Holy Spirit exalts Christ. We read in the books of Acts that Simon the sorcerer wanted the Holy Spirit for power and for basically personal use. And that was when P Peter rebuked him. Fourth, we must have a hatred of sin. Many people desire power, but they do not desire purity and holy living. They do not desire the Holy Spirit to prove, reprove them for their unclean, unlawful lives. But if we do not renounce sin and evil uncleanliness, it will be impossible for the Holy Spirit to control us. The Bible exhorts us to abhor that which is evil. That's Romans 12, 9 and to abstain from all appearances of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5.22. In past ages, the Old Testament days, the Holy Spirit was with men. But from Pentecost forward, God's purpose was that the Holy Spirit shall be in you. This is to be a sacred reality. The world receives him not, excuse me, the world receives him nor because it doesn't see him. The world is concerned with that which can be seen and tasted, handled, felt, tested in a laboratory, something that senses can identify. But the Christian is to realize the personal occupancy and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What would happen to all Christians? What would happen to their families and to their neighborhoods if the Holy Spirit, the Comforter of God, was guiding them into all truth? If they had the spirit, special outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Now apply this to ourselves. What would happen to us? According to the prophetic scriptures, there is a special spiritual refreshing that will take place just prior to the coming of Jesus. The Apostle Peter speaks of it in Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, 
when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Thus, we the experience was still future, and the time Peter spoke these words, surely it is to take place just before the coming of Christ, before the next verse says, And ye shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must have received until the times of restitution of all things. Hello. Which God... The outpouring of the Holy Spirit of the Comforter is for Christians, the believer, and we can look forward to the great experience in preparation for the final proclamation of the gospel to all the world just before the Savior's arrival. In the Apostle Peter's great Pentecostal sermon regarding in the second chapter of Acts, He declared that the events of that day were fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel 2. Joel 2 reads, And it came to pass in the last days when God said, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sins and your excuse me, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids. I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. If we read a few verses further in the uh, prophecy of Joel, second chapter, we find that there is actually to be a double fulfillment of the prophecy. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the format of rain excuse me, the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down to the earth the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. In Palestine, the early rains prepared the soil for the seed, sowing along in the autumn, while the latter rains in March of April ripened the grain for the harvest. So the early outpouring of the Holy Spirit prepared the world for the sowing of the gospel seed in those polished days. And now the final outpouring will come at the end of the gospel age to open the harvest of the earth. Jesus speaks of this harvest time as the end of the world. The harvest is the end of the world. We are to pray for that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the words of the prophet Zechariah. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of har in the time of latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. To be prepared for the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God's people everywhere in the world must put away sin and selfish ambition. There must be a mighty work of God upon our hearts. Are, are we making this preparation under God? Here is the one, excuse me, here is what one writer had said about, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the, whole, the Lord can pour out his spirit upon languishing church and the impenitent congregation. When the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, and the blessing will come. The hour is late. We must not delay. God needs us in his service. 
He needs all believers. He is waiting to borrow upon each of the Holy Spirit, each one, the Holy Spirit, in a greater measure. Greater measure. Are we ready? Are you ready? Am I ready? Are we waiting to receive him? One day, Dwight L. Moody was preaching in Chicago when two women came to him and said, We are praying for you, sir. Praying for me? He queried in surprise. Why am I not preaching the gospel? And they, they, Why don't you pray for those who need to hear it? They told him that he was preaching the gospel, but he was not preaching with power. When he heard that, he asked them to continue to pray. It helped to revolutionize not only his preaching, but his life. He became God's man in God's place, doing God's work in God's way. As awesome put it, excuse me, as someone put it, this is the power that you and I need, and we can have it today. God has promised it. The power comes only through the Holy Spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Holy Spirit will dwell within us, will lead us, will empower us. The Holy Spirit will do this for everyone who is willing to be led to the experience of everyone who walks in obedience to the faith. L. E. Froome, in his excellent book, The Coming of the Comforter, page 204, relates the experience of accomplished chime prayer by the name of Gadsden, who played only as one could make the music truly a part of worship. When the city of Charleston, South Carolina, was shaken, by an earthquake and was filled with terror and despair with people fleeing their lives, this man hurried to this post, sent peeling forth through the darkness the strains of rock of ages to hush and calm the hearts of the people. Certainly in that day, when the very foundations of faith are being shaken, when the hopes of men are perishing, when souls are filled with darkness and trouble, sorrow and despair, when multitudes are seeking hope and confusion, amid confusion, God must be calling his faithful bell ringers to peel out to the church and to the world. In one of my favorite hymns, it says, Holy Spirit, light divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Chase the shades of night away, turn my darkness into day. Holy Spirit, all divine, dwell within this heart of mine. Cast down every idle throne, reign supreme and reign alone. May this sermon be a blessing to everyone who's listened today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent down when he returned back to his father. The Holy Spirit is to direct our lives. The Holy Spirit is to help us to understand what Jesus is talking about. The Holy Spirit leads in paths of righteousness for our namesake. Please, Father, let us all be prepared for that day when Jesus comes so that we can all go home and be with you forever. I know that will be a great gathering of people and time that we'll see our friends and loved ones that have gone on before us. Thank you for all you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, give us a moment as we get ready to play the last song.